best, which face would be best? Yes, sodium tertrutoxide. Uh, sterically or sterically hindered. Uh, these two guys could do substitution. Uh, if you want elimination, more sterically hindered base. Now, do we have to worry about this giving a Hoffman product because it's too sterically hindered? No. There's only one elimination reaction possible here. There's only one beta hydrogen. The only place you can put the double bond is here. Okay? So it's, it's going to eliminate. Give that product. These could do substitution. We've already kind of, we've looked at that idea before, right? Uh, sterically hindered bases prefer, tend to promote elimination because they don't do substitution well. Because SN2 is highly governed by sterics. Sterics will inhibit SN2 reactions. Elimination is not inhibited as much by sterics, although you can get the difference between, say, Seth and Hoffman. Okay, let's finish this up here. Um, clever ways to make ionization of an alkyl halide easier or faster. Um, okay, to make an OH a better leaving group, protonated, which is a strong acid, how can you make a halide a better leaving group? Well, typically you don't need to. But sometimes you may because maybe it's on a secondary carbon and it's just reluctant to ionize for some reason. Um, one way to do it is to include silver ion, okay? So you take this, you want to do an elimination reaction, maybe you're using water or maybe you're using nothing. Uh, you just want it to ionize off. Throw in some silver nitrate, silver ion. And basically your halides are very attracted to silver ion. Now some books are hesitant to show this, but you could show this sort of maybe an attraction. You could even show it even bonding to it, just like an OH bonds. That makes it positive. But most books don't show it bonding because that's, that's a metal. There's some type of attraction that will facilitate this bromine <coughs> ionizing off. It pulls it off. Okay, so again, you could show this. At this point, this ionizes off. And you get the carbocation plus what? Plus silver bromide. Okay, and that's, that's a precipitate because that's usually insoluble. We saw that in the lab two weeks ago. Okay? So it's almost like protonating the halogen. You don't protonate halogens with strong acid. But the silver ion, it makes a strong complex, and I'm not sure what the mechanism is, but it can facilitate the ionization. <coughs> it strips it off, it makes the, forming the cation easier. So it's a clever way to essentially activate the halide for leaving. And then once it gets cut, once it comes off, then something can take the H, water can take it, take the H, these electrons move in. Get the double bond here. I showed HBr. Is that HBr? No, no. H M3. Oh, H3 O plus? H M3. Oh, H N O3. Okay, yeah, because we got the nitrite. Uh, we got the nitrite anion. I mean, you could show H3O plus, right? H3O plus and NO3 minus. That would finish it up. Of course, how does how do these two exist? That's nitric acid and water. They really exist like that, right? Nitric acid is a strong acid, so it's ionized in water. Um, okay, so silver ion. It's analogous to making the OH better leaving group with the proton. <coughs> Now the silver ion can also be used as a chemical test because when you get the, the precipitate, that's something that you can visually see. It can be a chemical test, a wet chemical test. Now it's only going to form silver halide if the halogen is ionizable. Okay? It's not going to form a precipitate with all halide compounds. Okay, which compounds below would give a precipitate with silver nitrate? That is a positive test. 
take is a positive test. Which ones would give a positive uh, test? The second one. Which bromides are ionizable? <coughs> Which Third. compounds below these three? Third. Not this one. Why? Because the halide is on what type of carbon? SP2, it's not going to ionize off of SP2 carbon. Okay, you can treat bromobenzene with silver nitrate. It's not going to form silver, silver bromide. That bromine is not ionizable. All these other ones, though, we can envision the bromine ionizing off, making a secondary carbocation. That would be tertiary with resonance. This would be primary with resonance in terms of cations. All these are theoretically possible. Okay, of these, which would give the precipitate of silver bromide the fastest? Tertiary. Which would be fastest? Tertiary. Tertiary with resonance, fastest. That's going to be the easiest uh, cation to form, right? <coughs> Okay, number two. What are we under? What was number one? What's the heading here? We're under G. Clever ways to make ionization uh, faster. Got to where we're at, right? Or we can use silver ion. What's another way to make ionization faster? Use a polar solvent. If you take this uh, bromide with this alcohol, and a polar non-nucleophilic solvent such as acetyl nitrile and DMSO, you can get the substitution product. And this would be an SN1 reaction, right? However, if you try to do this reaction in a non-polar solvent such as hexane, just a hydrocarbon, non-polar, likely no reaction. Because what's the main uh, rate determining step here? Ionization to give the carbocation, right? Polar solvents promote ionization. But you're making ions, and then ions can be coordinated with the solvent. Your sol solvent's polar, so your solvent's going to, since it's polar, it means the solvent has some negative portions. The negative portions will associate with the positive portions. Hug it, make it. Nice and warm and supportive. Hexane is not going to support this carbocation, so it's not going to give you any thermodynamic, thermodynamic stability of your carbocation. So, polar solvents promote ionization. You put HCl in water, what does it do? Ionize. You put HCl in hexane, what does it do? Or what does it not do? It don't ionize. It stays covalent. Okay, so those are two ways to promote ionization. Next topic is deuterium isotope effect. This is a neat way to determine if an elimination reaction is E1 or E2. Isotope effects are also uh, seen in a number of places in organic chemistry, likely to be seen also in organic too. Okay, look at this reaction. You take this alkyl bromide, treat it with pyridine. It's pyridine. You can get the alkene by elimination reaction, and then pyridine has the H. And the leaving group can sit with that. That's pyridine hydrobromide. Both E1 and E2 are theoretically possible. Which is it? Okay, just look at the reaction. Is that E1 or E2? If you don't know, what questions do you want to ask? Or information, more information would you like to know? Strong base. What question are you asking? Is it a strong base? Is pyridine a strong base? Well, is it? Is pyridine a strong base? No. Why not, Jay? 
Not an SP3 nitrogen, it's SP2 nitrogen. Did, I, did we ever say the SP2 nitrogens were strong bases or not? Well, maybe there's a gray area between SP3 and SP2. Maybe it's a strong enough base, but it's kind of weak up the strong base. All depends on how strong that is. Are you willing to bet a hundred million dollars that it's going to be E1? Or would you like some more proof? It's kind of borderline. Okay, well, you we can get more proof. And a deuterium isotope effect is one way to do that. How do we do this? Well, first off, before we talk about deuterium isotope effect, how would you have proven this last week? What information did you know last week to prove this? If it's E1 or E2. Rate, explain rate. Yeah, if it's E2, the concentration of both of them is important. If it's E1, the concentration of only this is important. So how would you develop an experiment to determine if it's E1 or E2? Add more of the base and see if the rate increases. Add more base, do the reaction one time, a certain amount of base, then come back and maybe double the base, then double this, see if the rate changes. What if you double this and the rate then changes? The rate then doubles. What's the mechanism? E2. E2. What if you double this and the rate doesn't change? E1. There you go. Okay. But deuterium is another way to do this. Because, let me ask you this. Two different mechanisms, elimination <coughs> mechanisms. And which elimination mechanism is the beta hydrogen abstracted in the rate determining step? Beta hydrogen is abstracted in the rate determining step of which mechanism? Jalen? No, what's the rate determining step of an E1? It's the same as SN1, carbocation being leaving group leaving. There's no abstraction of beta hydrogen in that step. The abstraction of beta hydrogen comes after that in the past step. But in the E2, it's all concerted. It's actually only one step as long as you're leaving the <coughs> activated. Beta hydrogen is abstracted in the rate determining step of the E2, but not in the E1. We can make use of that. Because if we convert the beta hydrogen to a deuterium, which is just an isotope of hydrogen, with one neutron, that's a mass number of two. It turns out that a carbon deuterium bond is stronger than a carbon hydrogen bond. And since the bond is stronger, it's going to be more difficult to abstract. It's going to be more difficult to break that bond. Well, that's only going to matter if the bond is being broken in the rate determining step. Which mechanism is the, is the beta hydrogen or beta deuterium bond broken in the rate determining step? E2. Basically, the deuterium will only give you a rate change with E2. If it's E1, you don't get a rate change because breaking that that deuterium bond would happen in the fast step there. Okay, that's all discussed here. So what you would do is you would have to do the, do the reaction with the H there, then you have to come around and do the reaction with the D here. Now you have to make this. This is called isotopically labeled. This is more, much more difficult than just changing the concentration or something. But this can be done. Now you do it, and you see, does the rate change now? What if we put a D here and the rate changes? What does that tell you about what the mechanism is? It's 
stuff. Let's say it's an E1. The rate change is right. Why would the rate change in E1? The, the, the carbon deuterium bond is not broken in the rate permanent step of E1. Okay, so E2 is <coughs> in E2. Which mechanism is the carbon deuterium bond broken in the rate permanent step? E2. Or carbon hydrogen, whichever one. H or D, same thing. But in some cases it is, in some cases. Okay. I would turn over and look at the back. Uh, some drug drug developers actually make use of deuterium because the CD bond is stronger. Thus, if that bond is broken at rate determining steps, the reaction is going to be slower. This is an HIV drug that is metabolized in the body. The body puts an OH here. It's an OH here. Your body can do this. Oxidation. Now, to put the OH there, you have to break the CH bond. Because that bond is no longer there, no longer a CH bond. And your body can break that bond. Uh, it's commonly that you put a fluorine here, and then this can't happen because it's not going to break the CF bond. But what drug companies are doing more and more now is instead of replacing the H with some type of just other atom, they're now replacing it with an isotope. And if you put a D here, that bond's going to be more difficult to break. Thus, the metabolism will not happen. Now, I can tell you the story here. When this drug gets metabolized to this, the drug is no longer active. Now, that can be good sometimes, or sometimes it can be bad, because if you want this drug to stay in the body longer, then you're like, I don't want this to happen. Well, how can we keep this from happening? Let's change the H to a different. D, and indeed, that slows it down. That also implies that the breaking of the, of the bond here is in some type of rate determining step. And so now they're trying to develop a, the drug that just has a deuterium here, which would last longer in the body. Maybe so the patient would only have to take one pill a day as opposed to two or something. Uh, that's an example of you taking advantage of the deuterium isotope effect. Uh, the stronger bond between the C and the D. <coughs> uh, those are just a couple of questions at the top you could uh, work on on your own. Uh, this brings us to pretty much the last topic of the handout, and that is double E2 elimination. If a compound has two leaving groups, well, you can do a double E2 elimination. Now, they can be very separate, and you can make two alkenes. But typically, what we're talking about is to make two pi bonds between the same carbons and thus end up with an alkyne. So typically this is a way to make alkynes. For example, you take this vicinal dichloride, treat it with two equivalents of strong base. Now we don't know which one's going to get eliminated first, but we can eliminate off. We also don't have any steric chemistry here, so I'm not able to worry about it. So I'm not going to have to do Newman. Uh, that's going to give what? I'm just going to draw an E because I don't have any reason to make me worry. I have to draw a Z. So 
this is if we remove HCl and make the alkene, right? find steer chemistry in the starting material. But from here, what if the base then came in and did another E2 elimination? And we go here, 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 what would that give? We then get triple bond eliminated two equivalents of HCl. So we did E2, we did E2, and we did a double E2 elimination. Any questions about this guy here though? we're going to get because I didn't have any stair chemistry to find here, so we didn't, we're not able to draw it in a new manure or anything. Question? I guess it would take much more um, energy to take away the second chlorine than the first Why? Um, I, I, don't know, I was just kind of trying to make an analogy to ionization, how it's like harder to take away like more electrons than put in an atom. So I was thinking, it doesn't work the same way here or not. I'm not following you, though. Uh, it's not ionizing. We're not making an ion. Uh, yeah. Other questions about this here? Nobody's concerned that this leaving group is not on the tetrahedral carbon? Anybody concerned about that? Yes, if we're going to do this, this guy is not on the tetrahedral carbon. It's always been a no-no. Actually, can't happen. Requires pretty high temperature, though. And the only time you're ever going to see it is if you double eliminate to make an alkyne. But you have to. The second leaving group thus has to come off of a non tetrahedral carbon. Okay? Typically requires pretty high heat, mainly because of this step right here eliminating the leaving group off of the non tetrahedral carbon. We're doing it by E2, we're not, we're not making a cation. Okay, that's from a visceral dihalide. You can also do geminal dihalides. Now down here, we're removing the beta hydrogens from the same carbon. Here we remove one from this carbon and the other came from the other carbon. But here we, hydroxide can be used as a base. Take the H, electrons move in, kick this off. The same thing here. Well, actually, there's no stair chemistry to show here, but there's nothing powerful. So when we put the double bond in, we've got a bromine left and a phenyl left. And over here, we have an ethyl. Uh, I reckon I'd probably put it here and an H. maybe Z. But then the hydroxide can come in and do it again. Take this H, these electrons move here, these electrons move off, and we get triple bond with phenyl and ethyl. 
So double E2 elimination here would give this alkyne. So we eliminate two equivalents of HPR. Any questions about this last step here? Any questions about that step? Yes. actually a good question, but you're giving the wrong argument. Your heat gives thermodynamic product and diene reactions. Um, I think it would be that because over here we had a choice. Um, so I just sort of put that up there. I didn't, I didn't really focus in on it. That's why I put the question mark there. Don't confuse that with dying reactions. Any any questions about this last step though? Nobody's concerned about the sin periplane arrangement of the H and the BR? Is that H and BR anti coplanar? Or are they cis coplanar? Cis meaning sin. What are they? Sin coplanar? No. Nobody concerned about that? Can you do sin coplanar elimination? Yeah. yeah. You can. Is that ever going to take place preferentially over an anti coplanar elimination? No, it will not. But do you have an anti coplanar elimination here? Okay. I just want to make sure everybody recognized that we were doing Senko planar elimination. Everybody did, right? Good. Jack, you saw it? Okay. Uh, okay, guys. Everything's there. You're not going to understand it sitting here in five minutes. Uh, on Friday, we need to start a new topic. Um, it may either be radical reactions or UV vis, but both of those are on the syllabus <coughs> outline. And uh, test on Monday. We'll see if there's any questions on Friday also about this material. Uh, see you in lab. Uh, have a good day, guys. <laughs>